Hey everybody, welcome to the first episode of Inside Vaping, uh, your weekly resource for vaping news. Our show airs live on Tuesday nights from 10 p.m. to midnight EST via YouTube live stream at www.youtube.com slash inside vaping. The show is divided into two distinct segments, the first half being the more formal top hat and tails version of the show. If you choose to participate in the second half of the show, you may join us exclusively on the Quest Vaping Network at www.vapers.tv slash Quest Vaping. But be warned, it's uncensored. And now to introduce the other members of this merry band here, we have Dane Smith, the professor. Yes, uh, we had to come out with a name for uh, Dane. Dane, and, and tell us a little bit about your tagline. Why, why did you choose the professor? <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to Inside Vaping, the inaugural broadcast. Um, the professor was actually a, a, a term coined for me a long time ago. Uh, I grew up uh, next door to a firehouse, and the, the, the chief fireman there, the guy who was in charge, I actually got stuck in the sliding door one day, and he called me the professor for not being able to get myself out. <laughs> so it's kind of stuck. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure this guy in the middle is familiar to uh, some people. This is the uh, the famous Ed the Green. Famous. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's way too much. Way too much. Unfortunately, I did not get stuck in a door when I was a kid. Um, so... <laughs> I couldn't have a cool name like the doctor. I, I don't know. I think the green is pretty cool. You you have a color like, as a name. A who? You have a color as a name. Correct. You've taken a whole color. I hope the color the the color of many things. <laughs> like like like. Green. Yes, I see your background. Yes. We we were worried that Ed was going to catch on fire because he's a very resourceful MacGyver type person, <laughs> and apparently what he uses as a diffuser for his light is a piece of paper towel, and uh, <laughs> it's it's hung I I think dangerously close to uh, the actual bulb, uh, which would lead me to think fire hazard, of course. But uh, you no, know, Ed's fearless it's, like that. I got uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, three you're measuring it. Three, it, the towel is three inches away from the heat source, so he's it's good. Three inches away. Three <laughs> inches away. Fire code is more than two. <laughs> What's going on, fellas? How are we doing? Outstanding. Uh, it is good to see all of my compatriots here this week. Um, I kept the seat warm last week for these two gents. Uh, Dagger was a little under the weather. And Ed was celebrating his anniversary, which, yes, uh, again, well, happy anniversary to you and your lovely wife. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a, it was a good time. Um, we just hung out on Saturday. and uh, not, not Saturday. On Tuesday. On Saturday, we actually celebrated. We went out to, oh, no, my diffuser fell down. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed the lighting change there. Yeah, isn't it something? Um, we went to Movie Co. Have you guys ever been to Movie Co.? I have. That is the dinner in a movie where you can eat dinner in the theater, correct? No. It's just a really nice movie theater, and they had these seats called the D-Box. So anybody wants to know, go to YouTube. Some of you are there already. And just go Movie Co. D-Box. The seat vibrates and moves. Cool. So as you wow. go, like, like, say you're in a plane and and you're like, <clears throat> we we saw Guardians of the Galaxy, so they're in a ship, and as they turned, the seat banked with the movie. Nice. It was really cool. It was really cool. You know, Ed, I'd like to go and see a movie like Guardians of the Galaxy in a theater like that because the only other time I've been in a theater like that was at uh, I think it was the Children's Museum. And I took my nephew there, and we saw some kind of SpongeBob movie where they blew water on you and puffs of air oh. hit you and all that. It just the 4D experience. Yeah, it was like a 4D experience SpongeBob movie, which I don't know. I, I I would definitely prefer to see Guardians of the Galaxy, but you know, we were out at ECC. My wife and I. My wife came out there with me. She wants nothing to do with uh, the conventions, of course. She doesn't vape. Uh, she definitely supports uh, me and 
she supports vaping. She thinks it's great, but uh, she stayed on the beach. And uh, we had a little bit of time away from the convention, too, and we went to Grauman's Chinese Theater. And uh, Grauman's is it's a great experience to go there, but they were showing Guardians of the Galaxy at Grauman's. And I wanted so badly to go, and she just didn't want to spend vacation in a movie theater when we're in California and we got this beautiful, balmy weather. But, uh, yeah, that's that's quite an experience. Yeah, but so. speaking of ECC, uh, we've got some stuff to talk about about ECC. Of course, that's been kind of a mixed bag. It was a great event. Um, a lot of modders out there, a lot of new products, a lot of excellent juice, um, and definitely saw a bunch of friends that I had not seen in a long time. But, of course, there's always some negatives as well. Um, but tonight, the first thing we want to talk to you about, Dane had found something, and it's called the uh, Cosmo, isn't it, Dane? Uh, yeah, it is the Cosmo eSig, and uh, this is a, a neat little device. P people that have been vaping for a while will remember a device called the, uh, the Janty Mid, and what the Janty Mid was was a connected eSig to an app or to a computer that you could monitor your vaping progress. Not only the progress of the vape itself, but you could actually set the intensity of vape, the duration of your puffs, and things like that. Um, and this product is very, very similar, except the, the major difference with this one is this one actually gives you an end game. Um, it will monitor your nicotine usage uh, as compared to the parameters that you set in, and, and what you hope to achieve, and, and I, I found it fascinating because it it, it 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 speaks to a sector of the market that that most e-cigs don't, and and that it gives people the end game of even quitting vaping as well as quitting smoking. And I thought it was really interesting to see. Um, it's it's quite an interesting little device. A team from Europe uh, designed and built this, and they started on the Kickstarter campaign. And uh, now I guess it is, uh, they're taking reserve sales. They've already sold out their first wave, and they're now going into their next wave of this product. Uh, but it, it's, it's quite an interesting little device, I thought. Yeah, and I've actually got the website up here, and that is the one um, definitive feature that's much different than anything else on the market, is it actually is trying to get you to the goal of quitting um, which, let's face it, we run into people all the time who that's what their end game is. And you hear people talk about how they've reduced their nicotine level and uh, now they're down to six milligrams. Some of them start vaping zero. And that's fine, but there's still that segment of the population that wants to get off of any type of nicotine product, any type of um, even hand habits for that matter. I mean, I, I can't imagine it, but but there's definitely people that are looking for something like that and I think it's a good product. Ed is smiling there in the middle. What, what are your thoughts on this? I know Ed, Ed also saw the Jenny Mid when it came out as well. Yeah, briefly, it, it, uh, Mick did a video on it and that's the last you ever saw of it. Right. Because it just, it just didn't go anywhere. And I, ha I, I'm, I gotta remember that this is the first half of the two hour show that the hand habit I have to save for the second half of the show. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm familiar with that hand habit you're talking about. Yes. Um, yeah, but the Janty Mid, too, it's interesting that you mentioned that because look at where we're at with the Proveri now. With right. the new version of the Proveri, what did they add in? They added in, I, I don't remember what it's called, it's like turbo mode or boost mode, something like that, right. uh, where they're actually changing the level uh, they're changing your voltage when you first hit that button to try and heat up the coil quicker. And, uh, you know, the truth is I would welcome a feature like that because, you know, I've got I've got this set up with nine wraps of, I think it was uh, 24 gauge per side. These are some massive micro coils uh, and it's coming out to 0.5. And it takes quite a bit of voltage to actually make this thing heat up. If you put it on a 3.7 volt device, you're going to be sitting there holding it, holding the button down, giving a little primer pull to it before you even start getting vapor out. Uh, whereas if you had a boost feature, you could heat up that coil and then drop the voltage and get a really satisfying vape out of it. So I think that's a, a good feature. And I you think the mid was kind of ahead of its time in that regard. A bit, but you know who 
came out with it first, it just never came to market. Who? Cisco. That Cisco doesn't surprise had me. a working prototype that you could actually do what you're saying. Wow. And I saw that, I believe, at the first or second VaporCon. I think it might have been the second VaporCon. Hmm. But yes, he already had a device that you could plug into a computer and can do all those controls. Then the EVIC came out, and then he, I don't think he went any further with it. I think the Janny Mid overcomplicated things too. The software was had a huge learning curve and it was really yeah. difficult to navigate through. And I think that was one of its biggest downfalls because everything that I had seen on it looked like it was incredibly complicated to set up a profile. And hopefully this device is considerably easier because I think that's what turned a lot of people off in the beginning. Plus the Janny Mid was just it was filled with with design flaws and performance flaws that never were really ironed out before it, it went to market. There was a lot of things you had to remember with the mid. Mm -hmm. Was that the didn't that one have the joystick on it? Yes, correct. So yeah, you had, it had to remember a directional what the pad. Stuff did. Yeah. So I mean I, I need a screen. Uh something I mean blinking lights, yeah, whatever. But you still have to remember what those lights do. Yeah. So I kinda get where they were going. They wanted to make something simple and easy minimalistic but it just didn't happen it just didn't happen and and it shows the, the market shows and no, nobody bought it yeah but you know uh, i think Preveri did it right because look at what they did too with the new version you know everybody's talking about how it doesn't it doesn't go high enough it doesn't have a high enough wattage it doesn't fire low resistance uh coils but you you have to remember the market that they're going after is not the niche market that is cloud chasers. It, it's really not. Um, and, and it's, it's a small market. Yeah. Compared. Yeah. Compared. And Proveri's never gone after that market. They've never done it. And and they've still got a solid device. I mean, I got I got two Proveri's sitting here. I just used the other one last week with, believe it or not, there you go. Look at that. It's not high end at all. It. It's uh, just a little you. mini yeah, I can't see it. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that's right. I, Ed and Dane can't see me. Well, you're missing nope. out. We, we will try to fix that in the future, I'm sure. Yes. Um, so I took a look at the Proveri. Obviously, the screen, now it shows your error messages are no longer just codes. It got an actual scrolling display. I think that's great. It makes it much more user-friendly, and, uh, you know, it's something that they needed to do. Um, the next topic we're going to talk about here, though, is ECC. Now, um, Ed, I don't know if you watched any of the coverage from ECC um, or you heard any of the stories surrounding ECC. Yes, but, I've been listening to some podcasts. Go on. Yeah. One, one of the big things that everybody's been talking about is the whole no-clone stance that they had. Um, and you have to understand, uh, my, my stepdaughter is in fashion design. She does all of these different shows. Uh, where she, you know, she'll go and, and look at clothing from these high-end designers, and one of the things that they have there is in their in their rider in their list of qualifications before you get a booth at that event, you can't have any type of a knockoff or a clone of a product that is being sold there by their vendors. So I believe that's completely reasonable for them to to uh, have that uh, consideration because again they've got these modders here are trying to sell their original products and then they have you know people that are coming in with clones from China and you know selling the clones there um, the only criticism that I can level against them is basically that I don't think it was made clear enough if somebody hands you this big contract that's 35 40 pages are you gonna read every word in the contract I mean, I wouldn't. From what I understand, it wasn't in the original contract, was it? It was. It was in the okay. contract, yeah. So it didn't really become public until about four or five days beforehand. Right, because there were a couple vendors that actually read through it and saw that, and then they backed out, and they got their refund. Uh, but um, there were a bunch that actually went to the event. They had clones. They couldn't carry them in. They couldn't set them up. They couldn't sell them. Um, and then, of course, there was another situation there. And some fallout surrounding that but before we talk about that I want to talk about some of the positives 
Um, you know, nothing really prepares you. And, and Dane and I have been to some major meets this year. Nothing can really prepare you for how much bigger and how many more people are concentrated into that tiny area. Uh, when I pulled up, uh, there was a huge line waiting to get into the door. And as soon as I walked in that door, I mean, everybody had these massive booths. Uh, definitely a lot of money there. Uh, you know, from looking at that, I am shocked that we have so many issues in this community uh, with just things that seem like common sense, um, common sense self-regulating. I, I, I don't know how to put it better, Dane, but, you know, there's so much money in this industry. And yet it's not, it hasn't been legitimized in the eyes of the outside world for the most part. And I don't know how easily it would be legitimized with certain things that are happening. Yeah, I agree. You, you know, you put on a big event like this um, and, and really the goal is, is to put the best foot of the vaping industry forward. And, and, I, and I'm certainly all for that. And, and I think there are so many innovative vendors and e-liquid manufacturers out there that, that this is the type of event that really lets these people shine. But to continue to be dragged down by people being served and, and you know, just little things like this along the way. James, you and I both know that whenever there's a big event, there's always something that's likely to happen. It's, it's never going to go very, very smoothly. I think expectations have changed a bit over yeah. the years when it comes to the bigger conventions. Yeah, and I believe that's true. And there's, there's always, there's always going to be something that didn't go quite right. Um, you know, no matter which event we attended, there was always some sort of an issue. Uh, by and large, ECC was a success. I mean, it was definitely a monetary success. But one of the big issues that Dane alluded to was while the vendors were there, I believe it was on, was that on Sunday, Dane? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. On Sunday, there was a company there that was actually selling clones of authentic mods that were also being sold at the event. And uh, this company was apparently served papers by a lawyer, and they disregarded the papers. They were told to, it was basically a C and D, so they were told to stop selling the clones there. Um, they did not comply, and then you had a group of modders, and I think there was an individual who was filming it, and they took matters into their own hands. They took papers over there, handed them to this company. And I'm, I'm not going to name any of the parties involved because that's, that's their business. But th the bottom line is there was a video that was circulating and it was completely uncalled for the way they handled it. On both parties, both parties' account, there was a lot of profanity. There was a lot of violent conjecture between both parties. And it's just unnecessary. It's unnecessary drama that doesn't put things in a good light. Um, was it actually a lawyer that delivered the papers? There was a lawyer there who delivered the first set of papers. That's my understanding. But then when those were apparently ripped up or disregarded, some of the modders themselves walked over there and very belligerently handed out these papers. And I understand, look, I understand their angle too, because here they have products that they're trying to sell here and you have a company that's selling clones of their products at a table that's very close by. So I get that. Um, but they did not handle it well. And it's just, it, it's, it's unfortunate that that happened. But, uh, you know, you, you got to move on from it. Uh, I believe in modders being able to protect their, their rights, their trademarks, their rights, even if they don't have an actual trademark that is recognized yet. As long as they have a trademark, it's still considered something that is valid and they can serve a cease and desist on it. Um, now, whether the person complies or not, that's, I mean, they could take it to court. They'd have to hash it out in court. Um, but it, it's just unfortunate that it turned out that way. But that being said, I'm going to say something here. Everybody knows, or a lot of people know, I'm a big proponent of original modders products. But right now, things are hitting a price point that I do not think is realistic or sustainable. And yeah, there aren't they? 
there's a couple devices out. One of them is there's a skeleton key. There's another mechanical out there called the glass. G L A S. I don't know. Have you seen that, Ed or Dane? No. Uh, no, I okay. have not. So the glass is basically it's a simple stainless steel tube mod, but you're talking about prices that are three hundred and fifty, three hundred and seventy dollars for a single battery size of a stainless steel mod. Which is ridiculous. It really is. I mean there's a certain point. And I had an argument with somebody the other day. I don't think the price point should be thirty bucks because if it's made in the USA and you have to pay somebody a wage and you have to run a machine shop and you have to do all these things, I don't think that's a sustainable price. But it also shouldn't be three hundred bucks. There's a happy medium. And one of the that things we're gonna talk about is there's a bunch of affordable mods on the market now. And we're going to talk about some of those. I'll say it's a very misleading name. The glass? The glass. I'm expecting a really cool <laughs> glass mod. You know, maybe yeah. like a glass insert, something to make the glass. Yeah. it's Supposedly, it's just a high level of machining and finishing and, and, and care that goes into it. Uh, but it's, you know, I, I don't know. A lot of it is hyperbole. It's, a lot of it is marketing. And we see the same thing with juices, too. I mean, heck, Jeannie can attest to that. Um, you know, it's all about packaging now. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, Jeannie knows a lot about the liquids, and maybe one day we need to bring her in on the show. Definitely. Yeah, that's definitely somebody. I mean, she's a, she's a veritable trove of information. But, Ed, uh, how would you know? I, I wanted to pick Ed's green, Ed Green's uh, brain here for a second. Going back to the to the no clone thing, do you, what type of uh, expectations do you have as a modder if you go into one of these events and then all of a sudden you start to see your products being sold at at a significantly reduced rate as clones at that event? Is 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 that something? that you take into consideration or is it is it you know is it something that you that you think about before going to an event or a deciding factor on one well uh, apparently i have not made it yet in this industry because <laughs> i have not i do not have a cloned product <laughs> it's not cloned yet <laughs> <laughs> um i guess i do have that ex i mean I'm not going to get mad about it. Is it a little shitty? Yeah. But I, a little language? I don't know. Maybe I should have said that. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. Um, it's not cool, but I, I'm not going to fork out the money to trademark, patent, and all that stuff, even though for the most part, if somebody else comes out with something called the spider, it looks like the spider. Man, I can go after them. I had that name first. How much is that going to cost me and a lawyer to go after this person? Yeah, it's not worth it to me. It's not worth my time. Um, if I was a full-time device maker, maybe. But since this is a hobby turned into a business, I have a full-time job that I rely on. So yeah. that's my. that's what I have to keep. I, I just love building stuff. That's why. Um, I would buy one. If, if somebody clones a spider, I'll buy one. Because <laughs> it's probably cheaper than what it costs me to make one. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, we're also... One of the topics I want to cover, too, is... I've, I've heard this term... Actually, just looking at Reddit and some of the other forums, it's enough to make your head hurt. Because if you read these back and forth between proponents of original modders devices and you know the people who like clones it's like there is a definite line in the sand drawn here and it's getting very violent which that's never been the level that i've taken it to um you know i've got all these original devices here and i there's some of them that are great and there's some of them that are not so great and they're overpriced there's others that are well worth what is being charged for them. Um, and there's no reason to apply labels to people. And that's the thing. You have vaping elitists now, and you have clone lovers. Those are the two terms that I've heard bandied about quite a bit. And Dane, you've probably heard it too. I mean, it's... it's. You know, I have. And and as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm using a device, and when I use it, 
I, that term is used on me. Um, yeah. And I, I guess I don't necessarily resent it. I started out vaping just like everybody else. I started out with a starter kit that I overpaid for probably somewhere. Um, and then I worked my way up uh, once I learned more about the products that were available. Um, I, 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 I am at a loss to explain why there would have to be division on, on something as simple as a device. You know, there, there are bigger fish to fry in this industry, and, and we have a lot of other issues that are certainly more pressing than this, than opposed to splitting off into factions about the device that you use. Uh, it, to me, it's just it, it, it's a senseless game that really has has no use. Yeah, it, it, and it, it doesn't it doesn't serve any good purpose. I mean, that's the bottom line. So, here's the way I look at it. it I'm not going to tell you to go out and buy a clone, but if you choose to buy one, I'm not going to criticize you because you did. Um, regardless of my personal feelings on it. It's what you've chosen as your delivery device so that you are staying off cigarettes. And our goal is what? It's tobacco harm reduction. It's not clone versus original here. So that being said, I still firmly believe in somebody's time being worth something and somebody's thought and care that they put into a design. Even if you say it's still just a mechanical tube mod, if there's a design on it or there's some innovation on it, I still feel that that should be respected. But that being said, if you walk up to me at a vape show or at a meet and you hand me a clone Addy and a clone mod and you want help building a coil, I'm going to help you. And so would Ed and so would Dane. Um, James, how do you feel about a modder who created a device, only made 250 of them, and said, I'm not making another one. Hmm. How do you feel about something of a clone like that? that you, and, and that's a valid point. Be, and, and we, again, people that have been vaping for a while have actually run into this as yeah. well. And, and I think it may not be the, the only catalyst, but it was certainly a catalyst for the clone wars to even start. Yeah. I do. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't really seen that situation before, but I suppose if it was a really sought-after device and the guy wasn't making them anymore, I mean, I know if I was a modder and I wanted to start making them again, I'd probably hit him up and I'd be like, hey, is it cool with you if I fill these orders? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm doing it out of the U.S. You know, that's that's one thing. But, again, it's it's his design, so... I don't know. It's kind of a gray area. Ed. I'm not saying that everything's defined here. I'm just saying that the thing we need to stray away from is just lambasting people because of how they choose to vape. And uh, a side note right quick. I am monitoring the YouTube stream chat. Dane is monitoring the Quest stream. Is that correct? Yes, I am. And uh, just so you know, um, Jerry would like a clone of uh, Uncle Dagger. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jerry needs a clone of uh, the Packers D right now, man. I know he's a cheesehead. And uh, yes, he's a, he he he's he was had his chest all poked out the first half of the Bears game, and that <laughs> just kind of sunk in by the end of the game. I was following along with that on Facebook as that was unfolding, and and I all I pictured was Ed laughing, and then I was I was cracking up as I was going. Yes, on. that was fabulous. I got, I got to get into more trash talking with Jerry. I definitely got to get into some more trash talking. I I don't think I prepared for trash talking with Jerry. He's got a pretty quick wit, man. I think that, I think I'd be unarmed in that battle. With I, I I have a secret weapon. Yeah. Yeah, I have two little girls that love him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Jeannie is asking, are we live on Quest? We are live on both networks yes. right now, and the after show portion of the show will be on Quest exclusively. Yes. So, um, so one of the other things we want to talk about here is, um, well, you know what, Dane, I'm going to kind of switch it up here. I want to talk hey, James, about, yeah. James, before you get to that, this section will also be um, uh, on replay on YouTube, correct? 
Yes. Correct. Okay, yeah. So yeah. anyone who misses this, you can watch the first hour on YouTube. The second hour, not so much. Okay, go on. So one of the things I want to talk about first, though, is there's some there's some modders that are honestly trying to bring devices to market that are reasonably priced. Um, and I, I would venture within anybody's reach, and I'm going to explain this, but do you see what I'm holding up here? Holy cow, look at that. It is the evil American spirit cigarettes here. And this is a little teaser for a future show because there are a bunch of things you can do with cigarettes that do not involve smoking them. Uh, so we're going to talk about some handy little parlor or bar tricks so you could rip an analog out of somebody's hand and repurpose it as... Well, I, I won't get into that on this show, but it's going to be interesting. So that's for a future show. Are but you going to do cigarette magic with those? Cigarette magic. That's right, Dane. Dane is... <laughs> Dane is a student of magic as well. He's uh, just a, a veritable treasure trove of uh, oh man, useless I'm getting, information. Why am I getting a, a uh, I'm getting a call right now. I need to hang up on that. Doggone. Okay, anyway, I was talking about mods. Okay, so reasonably priced mods. Let's go ahead and take a look at this right now. So there's these companies coming out with these affordable original devices here. And let me see if I can get the right one up here. This first one that we see on the screen, this is the Lifestyle Mod by AVP, uh, which is available from the Vapor Project and uh, a couple other stores in California and uh, quite a few online retailers. But it's a, it's a pretty cool device. It's actually, it comes with all three tubes. You can see the specs there. There's a drip tip that's included with it, dedicated battery tubes, brass contacts, made in the USA, 125 bucks. So it's not too bad as far as pricing. And there you can see each tube has a different type of accent mark on it. But that's a pretty neat one. Now this one here, this is the workhorse mod by Super T Manufacturing and look at that price $69.99 and if you've um. been in vaping for a while you're probably familiar with Super T and Super Dave and the Precise series and all the different mechanicals that they came out with but he's got this get thing with palladium uh, plated brass contacts you get a single tube but $69.99 that's honestly not too bad that's a great price point yeah yeah it's that's great that's great. And for those of you who don't know, Super T is made the original drip tip. Yeah. Yep. And they were, I love those Super T tips. You remember the whistle tips, Ed? Yeah, I remember them, the but most everything ones? they made was made out of metal, and I don't like metal tips. Oh. You like uh, the I gelatin like the, tips? Well, the first thing that came out was the Delrin and then acrylics. Um, but I really like the Delrin stuff. The acrylics sometimes give a funny flavor. Uh, yeah, even, yeah the, really like even the button is nice on this, though. If you can see the screen there, Ed, you can see it's got the nice engraving on it. it. But, I mean, kudos to them for being able to put it out for 70 bucks. I haven't really seen too many modders that are willing to, you know, produce stuff at that level. Um, so it's the nice. next thing here, and I'm sure a lot of you have probably seen this one. This is the uh, the Colonial mod. Uh, now this comes in three different finishes. It's uh, aluminum. It does have the concave firing button. It's very comfortable. It's a, it's a really nice mod. It's lightweight. Um, I had the chance to use one. Um, it comes. There is an optional drip tip and top cap that will fit on a Patriot atomizer, and I think it fits on the Igo M as well. And it gives it a really nice look because everything looks perfect. I mean, all the finishes match up. And that retails for ninety nine ninety five. So, uh, you know, it's kind of nice to see that there's options out there for people who want to stay original and want to buy in the U.S. a U.S. made product. And it's not it's not going to break the bank, which is nice. So. Yeah, but you know, even at that price point, I mean, Super T could come out with a fifty dollar mod, and China will still clone it. Because they'll still be able to sell it for twenty five. They bucks. will, and this is this is where, I don't know. Am I going to say that I don't buy anything Chinese? No, because that would be a lie. I mean, how many things in our house right now? I mean, most of the things that we're looking at 
heck, Ed, you showed me that mock-up. Go ahead and show people what you mocked up there for the iPhone. I want to. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah. So I was. I, I ordered myself the iPhone six plus, and I was curious on what it felt like. So um, there was a website that actually um, put up cutouts of all three. The the six plus, the six, and still the five. So you can see the difference. And then I was like, hey. You know that that feels kind of good. I can. Say, hey, what's going on? Yeah, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just watching Inside Vaping with Dane and uh, with Dane and James. Yeah, but the professor just a horrible name. I don't get it. It's <laughs> <laughs> that hat, man. So yeah, but yet again, Apple. Pro now, this is my stance on Chinese. Though everything made in China is not crap. Right. The iPhones are made in China. But but this is. It's and I'm glad you brought that up, Ed. Because I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but. Foxconn, okay, so you're familiar with Co Foxconn. Okay, okay, does Ed want the camera again? No, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have these secret hand gestures. I'm going to clue everybody into the hand gestures because I'm running all the cameras. So if he if he pulls on his ear, that means he wants me to focus on him. So, focus on me you know, so I can say in that Apple holds a high standard to China. This says, hey, I want you to make this product. It's going to be less expensive to make in right. China. But I still want you to hold a high quality. It's when company goes, hey, I want to buy this and tell me how much it's going to cost. Well, if you want it really nice, it's going to cost $5. But we can get it for you for $0.50 cents using right. half-ass points. Right. Yeah. And, but but here's, here's the thing I was going to say, Ed, is, you know, Foxconn plants, where these people work and they assemble the iPhones and stuff, they're getting paid what, like twenty, twenty-five bucks an hour. I mean, how can you, how can you compete? Let's say you're in the U.S. and you want to make a device and you don't want to outsource to China. How can you compete? That is the question that I want to ask. Do you think it's possible? Can you hit those Chinese price points, knowing what materials cost? And, no. And no, let's I let's look at like uh, insurance coverage. If you have employees that are working in in a machine, uh, you know, in a, in a mill environment or in a machine shop environment. I mean, you have to have insurance. You have to have Absolutely. employees. I mean, there's no way you can possibly hit those price points. And no, there's no so, way. So my only gripe is with the guys, and there's a bunch of them that are yelling, there's no way these mechs made in the U.S. should cost more than $30 a mod. And to that I say BS, because I don't see how it's possible for them to produce mods in the U.S., even if they did bulk runs, and still have a reasonable level of quality control to them. I, I'm I mean, going to, this, this is about, uh, uh, about average. My machinist cost $2 a minute. It's yeah. $120 an hour. So when I have a part that's on the lathe, if it takes five minutes to make, that's a ten dollar. Right. That's a ten dollar part. Right. And that's only for one setup. Right. Well, I mean that. That's all I'm going to talk. I, I. I don't want. This is a dead horse topic anyway. I mean, how many times have we talked about this over the last couple of years? I on mean, this show, just once. Yeah. Well, <laughs> on, on this show, okay. Yeah. First time. I know. I hop around a lot. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, moving on. So uh, we. I don't know, Dane. We were going to talk a little bit about the e-liquid testing controversy that's going on as of late here. Um, and obviously that topic has taken on a life of its own. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, discourse about uh, diacetyl and acetylpropanol and all of these derivatives and the dicotones and the, the harm that is possible with these things in e-liquid. And I don't know. What are your thoughts on this whole thing, Dane? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, for me personally, I, I like to at least try to know that I'm vaping the safest possible e-liquid, knowing that it's never going to be a hundred percent safe. That being said, I'm also not in favor of witch hunts either. Um, and I think a lot of these, um, you know. It, S sending off of samples to be tested and, and pointing them out in a, in, a, in a public platform is a witch hunt. I, you know, it, it, talk to your vendors, ask your vendors, 
most people vape e-liquid from from reputable vendors that they know, and, and I think that's a good thing. And, and you know, will the government require testing? We don't know. I, it, maybe in some form or fashion, it's possible. Um, should the flavoring companies be tested? I certainly think that it starts up higher on the food chain like that, and it and it certainly would help. It would it would ease the conscience of a lot of the end consumers if they had access to the, to those tests and and that being posted. In Europe, there are a few sites that actually uh, post the the test results of their flavorings and their liquids, and I think that's a good thing. But again, it, it, it's a voluntary thing. If you have a question about e liquid, ask the person you get it from. Yeah. And 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 don't um, don't take their word for it. If you really want to know, ask them for documentation. If they right. want your money, they want your sale, they're going to give you documentation. I'm sure we're going to talk about a little bit more on it next show because uh, I believe Russ from ClickBang um, sent some liquids out to get tested himself um, because he wasn't getting a response back from the the e liquid manufacturer. Um, there was another point I was making. Oh, um, Kevin from BP Live Network. He is he created a website called Diacetyl Free or Diacetyl 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 Free eLiquid .com. and he's urging companies. It's a free service. They submit their documentation saying, "Hey, this bottle of eLiquid was tested. Here's the document." They're on the website. It's a place where anyone can go to say, "You know what?" I want to vape as safe as I possibly can. I can yeah. go to that website and I can see, hey, all these liquids have been tested and approved. Let me go there and buy it. I think it's a great idea. Right. Nitrobex has a question in uh, Quest Chat. Uh, he says and asks, what if they don't or they won't do testing on their liquid due to cost? Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's I don't think that's a valid point anymore. I mean, what is what is the MSDS testing cost? I mean, that's isn't it like two hundred and two hundred and thirty dollars? About two hundred bucks. Yeah. It, depending on what you're testing yeah. for, I think the average was about two hundred dollars. So, two hundred and thirty bucks, I believe. Um, you know, look at the markup that is in e-liquid right now. I mean, it, I don't see how anybody who is reasonably successful can't afford to have unless. Okay, here you go. I love Juicy Vapor, but doggone, man. Imagine if Anthony had to send out all his flavors. I don't know. Maybe he has. But right. I, I, And I personally think a company like, like Juicy Vapor, they should be able to t bring in their flavorings and ha and not wait for or rely on the, the flavoring company to test it. I think Juicy Vapor should test the flavorings because he's buying it by the the gallon or the five gallon, I'm, right. not, I'm not sure. But I think that's how maybe he should do that. Then all of his flavorings are diacetyl isopropanol free. Yeah, but, well, here's the thing, though, and and Jeannie can speak to this. Obviously, you know, we're going to have to have Jeannie on because uh, we need her knowledge. But I'm pretty sure that once you combine these flavorings in your e-liquid base, it can also form after the fact. So even if the flavorings are tested to be diacetyl free, or acetylpropanol free, um, you can still have that develop inside the the mixed cohesive juice. So th that's that's kind of a concern too. But y y something has to give. I mean, at this point, the cat's out of the bag. I'm sure there's people that knew this years ago or over a year ago, uh, but now it's brought to light, and they're definitely going to have to do something. And uh, I agree. And I think for, some of this and that's testing. Go ahead. I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, James. I, some of this testing, um, it, it's it's great to look at diacetyl and acetylpropanol and, and those other types of ingredients as well. Um, some of the things that I think we can be concerned with as well is the environment that the liquid's made in, um, particulate matter that winds up in juice and things like that. There's, there's a, a myriad of different things that can happen along the process from flavors and bases to end product. And, and I think some governing bodies are not governing bodies, and some organizations tend to look at one and not the other. And I think we're a little myopic that way. I, and, and I think we could look at all of it because all of it is just as important. Right. 
Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing. It's like it's it's now it's not even just dias diacetyl. It's all these other things that you have vendors that are in some cases supposedly putting into the juice. Um, you know, obviously we remember the uh, what was it? Unicorn milk, right? Unicorn milk and the I can't remember the name of the compound that was in titanium that dioxide. Titanium yeah, it's a, dioxide, right? Yeah, so it was that a white, white food coloring. White food coloring, which that was an issue, um, and you know, obviously, Suicide Bunny is under a lot of scrutiny right now. Um, but you know, this has happened with other vendors in the past. I I, I kind of feel like they've gotten the the raw end of the deal and part of this. As long as they do what they're supposed to do and they have everything tested, I'm fine with Suicide Bunny. Because, uh, let's face it, how many other e-liquid manufacturers do you think there are out there who have not gotten any testing at this point? Um, so that was just basically pulling a name out of a hat. Uh, but one of the things I want to bring up, and I've got, let me see if I can get this pulled up on the camera here. And that is the wrong window. What happened to my... My dog on. Now I'm looking at chat. <laughs> okay, that did not work right. All right. Well, I was going to show you an article that was talking about um, the addition of saline in certain liquids, and this is from Spin Fuel. I don't know how much validity you can add to this, but uh, Spin Fuel. Somebody was saying that there were vendors that were adding uh, saline solution to organic flavors in particular because uh, they didn't emulsify properly or they they weren't held in solution without having some other sort of a, a, a substance in it. And they're saying that, you know, this can actually form uh, chlorine gas, <laughs> you know, when it's vaped, which I, I don't know how much credence I give to that. I think they need to actually do some scientific testing to back that up. Uh, so, you know, you're going to see these articles coming up, and it's almost like it's scare tactics at a certain point. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know, Dane. It's, it's like we see more and more of these things popping up every day. Yeah, it, it's what grabs the headlines, and, and, and it's what garners the most attention. And, you know, I'm not convinced that that's the right approach either. There's no reason to gang up on particular vendors and go on witch hunts with particular vendors because a, a, a compound has been removed or not removed from a particular e-liquid. Um, until, you know, that, that particular vendor tests their e-liquid and actually publishes those tests, you know, you, you have no way of knowing unless you contact them yourself and, and ask them yourself, which is why I implore most vapors, if you find a juice you really like and, and you're concerned about its compounds and what's in it, ask the manufacturer. Hey, yes. Most are more than willing to, to share what what ingredient list is is in their juice. Yeah. And Jeannie Kay had a good point in chat. She says, witch hunts are not needed. We are only fueling the FDA and the media. And exactly. that's the thing, folks. I mean, it, it, not all attention is good attention. I mean, you've, you've, you've heard that before. Um, but in this case, it's not. Um, this, is, this is a situation that, you know, obviously I think uh, there are some things that we need to handle as an industry but to air our dirty laundry all over the place and sensationalize it ourselves i mean that's always been the job of the ants i mean i agree with you because this industry is still growing it's a burgeoning industry and it's going through growing pains and these are the type of things that happen to young and new industries with their products, with their procedures, with with everything that goes into the component of an e-cig. And I think ultimately these things will will be taken care of. Yeah. I'm going to try and bring up that web shot anyway, so I don't know why my screen changed, but I'm going to go ahead and do this on the fly just because I'd like to get the information out there. Because um, we have a couple articles we want to talk about here. Um, so this is basically the spin fuel article, uh, and I, again, I, I don't think this is something you should concern yourself with because they don't have anything scientific to back it up at this point. But one of the nice things, one of the things I do want to call attention to is the TSA, and this is an older article, but uh, this is the first show that we've actually done here uh, with the new format. Uh, TSA gives the green light to pack e-cigs in carry-on bags. 
And Dane, you've done a lot of traveling, as I have in the past year, and, uh, you know, there, there's some common sense things that you can do when you're traveling. Right. Um, and uh, they actually had an incident supposedly somewhere out east where uh, an ego had continuously fired or shorted out inside a bag, and, uh, you know, there was a uproar about that. But uh, one of the things that uh, I would say is a definite must is take all your batteries and put them into the battery boxes or have them in separate uh, baggies if you're going to store them uh, right. when you're flying. And all of that stuff needs to be on your carry-on, not your check baggage. Uh, and, I, you know, I've talked to many vapors who had all their mods and all kinds of rebuildable supplies in the check baggage. Another thing, too, you know, as much as it hurts for these rebuildable guys, don't, don't put this in your... Uh, your carry-on <laughs> luggage. You don't want your butane or your torches in there. Um, so that seems like common sense. But, again, a lot of people don't think about that. If you've got a mech, and trust me, I saw this firsthand at Vape Blast 2.0. Of course, we had the mod explosion that happened there. Uh, you don't want that thing unlocking and continuously firing in your bag. Uh, so take the batteries out. I don't care how good you think the lock is. Take it out. And... Um, yeah, just uh, try to observe some safety. Now, I've been using this vaping Kiko bag here. And one of the things I like to do is it's got all these slots in it. And this is for the TSA's uh, ease of inspection, I guess. I put my batteries into the mod slots because I never have it completely filled with mods. And then I have these bottles here. I travel with these bottles. These are 25 mil bottles. And then there's also a 15 mil version and these are from Team Rampage over in Korea, but, you know, honestly, get a bunch of friends together, you can buy these things pretty cheap. But they sit inside these holders, and that way you can have all your liquid and your mods and your batteries in a bag and say, here you go, guys. Please don't make me wait or give me a uh, customized pat-down bend-over search, because I don't want that. Yeah, I, and, and Nitro, Nitrovex had a, had a great uh, a comment in chat as well. He said, in my honest opinion, batteries of any kind are more dangerous than anything in our liquid, especially when it comes to traveling. And, and I, you know, if I carry a mech mod, it's always empty. If I'm going to put it in check baggage, it's, you know, the tube is actually taken apart. Top cap, bottom cap, batteries out in battery boxes, um, just for safety's sake alone. Um, usually, I... I'm the type of vapor that uses different products for different situations. When I travel, James knows well that I, I carry an e-roll with me. That's always that's in my pocket. Um, I'll carry another DNA 20 device with long battery life, like my Spider, because I know that once I get to my destination, that that mod is going to give me the longest battery life without charging. You know, it's it's just things like that. It's just just planning ahead and and using a little common sense but i've never ever had an issue with tsa going through any checkpoint no well, which 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 just uh, brought up a point in uh, some devices it's uh the batteries on board it's a lipo pack in that case take the atomizer off right right just take the atomizer off um uh we've got stopped traveling back and forth years ago when you got devices like this and through an x-ray machine it looks like a button and an antenna. Yeah. And I always took it apart. My friend I was flying with did not, and they wanted to search his bag. They're like, what is this? And basically, they just wanted him to use it. Use it. Let me see vapor coming off. Be on your way. But, yeah. If you got a mod device that you can't take the battery out, just take the atomizer off. Right. And, and here you go. I'm going to show you guys this, because this is the one mod that the TSA will not allow on on an airline right here the cool fire 2 <laughs> so if you got the grenade mod don't even think about it uh yeah that one to me is just astonishing that someone would yeah. try to bring There you that go look at look at Ed the green Ed the green has his <laughs> Did you pull the pin on that one already Ed <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Just use common sense. I mean, again, don't bring torches. Don't bring butane. Um, again, if you've got, okay, here's a good point because I actually had this happen. So I carry this bag around. Okay, this big bag of rebuildable stuff, and 
I've got some, I've got an awl in here, and I have a dental pick, and I've got, I actually have a small knife, and I forgot about all this stuff, and I had it in my carry-on bag, because all my other vape gear was in there, and they actually took this, they went through it, and they confiscated a couple of the things that I had in here. I had a nice screwdriver in here from Germany, and they took that, because again I guess they would be considered weapons so I would say your RBA kit with your tools in your checked baggage take everything else with you that's the best thing to do yeah, I agree I agree traveling is much quicker that way too because there's nothing worse than being hung up in TSA and having to explain you know an entire bag full of contents and what you actually use those contents for so next, wow. we've got a go ahead, Ed. No, I was just saying this hour's like just flown by. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so next, we have this article. This is, I'll tell you what. There's some people, some of these people who are our opponents here with the whole e-cig and tobacco harm reduction thing. They're they're really underhanded, and um, you know, a lot of times they try to present things diplomatically, ninety nine percent of the time, and then you get that one situation where the guys really ticked off and then you get what they're really like and uh, this story is indicative of just that thing this is about uh, a professor over in the UK this is uh, Professor John Ashton and I'm gonna go ahead and read this story because this is just incredible um, Professor John Ashton quit role as president of Faculty of Public Health doctor was involved in venomous spat on microblogging swipe site Twitter feels strongly about long-term effects of smoking electronic cigarettes. So let me just give you some snippets here. Uh, Professor John Ashton st stepped down as president of the Faculty of Public Health yesterday following a venomous spat on the social media site. The doctor, who is strongly opposed to e-cigarettes, called one supporter a C. And again, I'm sure you can guess what that word is. It's probably one of the most heinous um, profane words in the language. In another tweet he said, these abusive e-cig people remind me of the lads who used to play with themselves behind the bike sheds at school. They are even more pathetic than that. They need e-cigs to get aroused. He has been involved in a debate about the merits and dangers of e-cigarettes. Advocates say they help smokers quit, while objectors such as Professor Ashton, who want tighter controls, are concerned about their long-term effects. They also believe the tobacco industry is using e-cigarettes to lure youngsters into smoking. In the online debate, Professor Ashton complained he was being abused by e-cig trolls and accused them of being apologists for the industry. He hit back at one, saying, have you always been an anonymous C? And he told another, I think I have identified a new species of human being this week. Obsessive, compulsive, abusive, onanist, with e-cig tendencies. Um, so this is really just one of those cases where you see what somebody is truly like. And this is the type of people that we're dealing with on a daily basis. They don't really care about how much merit uh, tobacco harm reduction has. To them, it's all about uh, progressing their political agendas. So, I don't know. Yeah, truly the ramblings of a man who is just not right. And I, when I, I read that article, and I, and, I, and I couldn't believe it at first, I thought it was misreported. So I went back and read it again, and sure enough... I, it, it never ceases to amaze me the, the ramblings that that come out of of anti vaping and anti electronic cigarette uh, people. It, yeah. It's it, to, to resort to name calling like that. And what really stuck out to me is is it reminded him of lads out behind the shed. And I thought, <laughs> how, how how does this analogy even made? This is a real stretch here. Yeah. Ah, I don't know what what lads behind the sheds were doing. <laughs> I mean, we have the internet now. <laughs> I, I know. I think I think it was the hand gestures that you said were reserved for the second hour. Ed. That's that's what the lads were doing behind the shed. Right. Um, 
I, I don't know, man. It, it's it's stuff like this, and uh, we've we've got another article here. I believe Dane has some information to present here on another article. Let me go. Ahead I and do. That um, it was uh, Jeff Steyer on the the New York vaping ban. He uh, he wrote a little op-ed uh, rebuttal, uh, and I, and I'll read a little bit here. Uh, this failure in public policy provides the most striking and objective evidence to date, showing that Mayor Bloomberg's aggressive anti-smoking campaign has been ineffective, said the Manhattan-based Jeff Steyer, senior fellow at the National Center for Public Policy Research. Steyer argues that it's not that the city wasn't spending enough money or that the laws weren't restrictive enough. Rather, he says, while Bloomberg was busy punishing smokers and squandering taxpayer money, the city was among the first to ban the use of e-cigs in public places. Yet the emergence of e-cigarettes are perhaps the most promising development that could help people quit, says Steyer. But instead of supporting their use to help people quit smoking, the New York City public health establishment spends resources demonizing e-cigarettes and making them less appealing to potential switchers. I, Steyer, for one, am not surprised that the nanny state approach was ineffective in New York City, he said. Public health officials should learn a lesson. Put your hands back in your pockets, stop asking for more money and more tax increases for your ineffective policies, and instead show some humility given the new findings. I, I, and I think he's absolutely spot on here. I, I, re I really do. Uh, this was a, a well-thought, well-written piece, and, and it was very true and very indicative of not only New York City, but a lot of the other local municipalities across the country. Well, I think you're getting to that point where they're seeing irrefutable proof, and it's, um, you know, it, it's it's driving them crazy because uh, obviously once this thing catches on and people see that there's all of these cases where there's cognitive benefits, there's uh, uh, benefits for people who have things like Parkinson's and. You know, there's even a movement among, like, artists and creative types where they're talking about the benefits of nicotine that is well documented over the course of the last eight or ten years. There's been a lot of research into that. And, uh, you know, it, it, this is irrefutable proof. And, again, I'm going to recall that statement. I can't remember the name of the guy, but he was over in the U.K., and he just said, e-cigs are the greatest health advance since vaccination. Right. And I believe that. I believe that. Um, wow. Yeah. Go ahead, Ed. Wow. No, just wow. Just it, <laughs> a smart guy. You know? so, somebody like asked. Words. Somebody asked what the picking your nose gesture was for. Does that mean get the camera off me? <laughs> <laughs> I got allergies. <laughs> it's yeah. a little dry in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that's the thing too. I've been going through that too. I, th I think it's a seasonal thing. Well, what a fast hour, guys. Yeah, it was. That was a really it quick was. hour. I think we covered pretty much everything that we were going to report here. I believe so. We did. Um, so. I was going to show off a couple of things that I've got for upcoming reviews. Um, ah, we got we got plenty of shows to come. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that, that is true. But one of, the, one of the things I do want to show here, because I think it's pretty damn cool. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, there it is. Okay. So this is called the Wolf Call RBA. And I will try to adjust my focus in. And one of the things that you will notice here is it is a dripper with no apparent air holes. You see that? And it actually gets its airflow from the base so you can you can drip quite a bit of juice into this and it's not going to leak it's a really unique design so there's a small gap around that base and it comes in through the bottom through a gap between the 510 and the actual atomizer and it is a tiny gap so it doesn't look that odd and then it has these air holes in the deck itself so the air passes directly over the coils and it comes with different air inserts and this is my first experience with this design, so I'm going to be doing a rebuild and a review on that device coming up here soon. But uh, really interesting. 
Yeah, it's an interesting design. And and when you had first showed me, I had wondered where the airflow was, and I thought, how could that that atomizer be any good when there's no airflow there? Yeah, and in yeah, the, the, the Fat Daddy 510 JT3 vape just said uh, that would be great for a Fat Daddy 510. It would be too because there's actually a, a small milled area that will still allow airflow even if it's flush, which is kind of neat. Wow. So I think this is where we are going to actually end the first part of the show here. So we're going to bid farewell to our YouTube audience. Thank again, you all for joining us on this inaugural edition. Uh, keep an eye on our YouTube channel. Like and subscribe. We will be there often. We'll be doing live events when we go. Uh, certainly reviews are in the pipeline. Ed has his own Modders Corner, which he'll be working in as well. Yeah. yeah we might be doing a little something, something. I'll be doing something, something. I'm sure uh, if you're watching this replay on YouTube right now, there will be some links in the description down below to our Facebook page. And also to our after hours. And um, Dane, I think I gave you Logitech webcam controller face accidentally. <laughs> I think I had the window <laughs> overlaid. I got to get a separate monitor. That's right. The man behind the curtain is flawed. He is not the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> that is apparent. Uh, thank you very much for joining us via YouTube, and we will see you next Tuesday evening. And until next time, I don't know. Vape safe. Vape loud. Vape safe. Vape, vape softly. Vape strong and take come on, everything. come on over to uh, what is that? Vape Vapors TV. Yeah, Vapors TV slash Quest Vaping. Join us over there for the last hour of the show, and uh, we will all interact there. Yep. Yep. <laughs>